Quite simply, Harrisonburg is the greatest place that I've had the honor of living. Uh, the atmosphere here is one of family. The community is incredibly focused on helping other people uh, and being a place known as the friendly city, and it really is. We're big enough that we have a decent call volume for those that obviously get into this career to respond to emergency incidents, but we're also small enough that we know each other. I know, you know, I know everybody's name that rides on every rig in the city. You get a nice mixture. You've got the college town with James Madison being around. You've got the, the shops downtown, the, the old downtown look of you know, the older cities and things like that. So you get a mixture of everything, plus you can get in you know, kind of the suburbs of the city and get you know, your bigger houses and stuff, and then kind of down in town you get more houses packed on top of each other and things like that. So you get a good mixture of everything here in the city. We have a lot of highly trained individuals in our department. Um, a lot of respect throughout the state from other departments. You know, that's what brings a lot of people to us. Structure fire, 438 Broad Street in Harrisonburg. Engine four, engine one, engine three, engine two, tower one, battalion four, structure fire, 438 Broad Street. 438 Broad Street in Harrisonburg, Cross Street, Eventure Street, and East Gate Street. Operate Tech 7, 1007. using a reserve piece of apparatus for the day, the front line piece of apparatus was down. We go out to the, you know, the rig, we get dressed. We noticed, you know, one person's a little behind. Apparently he was upstairs and we were all downstairs, so it kind of delayed his response a little bit. And uh, so he jumped in the rig, you know, with the older style ladder truck, you can't, there's no seat belt warnings, there's no nothing. There, you know, I can't see him from where I'm sitting. So it's always, hey, y'all ready to go? The driver says, and we go. I was going to the bathroom, so next thing you know, beep, 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 structure fire, and uh, I was like, great, awesome. Now I'm already behind, you know. So, uh, so I run out and I run down the steps and the engine, they were already pulling out of the bay. And uh, I was like, well shoot, you know, like I'm already, I'm already behind. So I ran over there and everybody else was in the truck. So I uh, put my pants on and my Nomex and threw the rest of my stuff inside and slammed the door. I'm like, all right, and I put my headset on. I'm like, all right, let's go, let's go. And I was sitting down, uh, had my, my belt, it was a lap belt, and the uh, Tower 2 is what we run as first out. So I pulled it up, and I'm like, I need my radio strap. And I'm like, I always put that on. It's just like my thing. I always put it on before I put my jacket on. So I was like looking around, kind of like trying to, I was like, where, where is my radio strap? At this time, we had turned on to Maryland. And I was like, where is my radio strap? Because I, I didn't see it anywhere. I was like, great, I done left it. Now I'm going to a fire. So at that time we had went over the railroad tracks and uh, I was pulling up on my jacket. Uh, when I did, my foot slipped into, uh, there's a little hole between the step and the door. And uh, so I fell back into that. So I'm like trying to get the jacket back to the side so I can actually step up and not have to worry about it. I mean, at that time is when we were going around the turn. So that's when the door popped open. Next thing I remember is waking up and looking up and seeing cars in front of me. I immediately jumped up. You know, adrenaline was probably going. You know, I didn't really think of being hurt or anything like that. So I just I jumped up and started running back to the rig. And why was the door open? Because I didn't see, I couldn't see him at first. So the only thing I seen was a door open. So my immediate thing was to start breaking to stop to see why the door was open. And as that door starting to go back towards the closed position, I visualized Josh laying in the road. Holy shit, he's laying in the road. 
And I was like, what do you mean he's laying in the road? He said, he's in the road. So immediately, jump out. I go around the backside of the ladder truck. And by the time I come around, he's already up and walking back to the rig. And I'm like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Let's go, let's go. We got a fire to go to. I said, are you sure you're okay? He said, I'm fine. Right after I became the fire chief, I started a process of looking at our turnout times on a monthly basis. When people call 911 and they say that they're having an emergency, it is up to us to get up, get out the door as fast as we possibly can. We're not asking you to do anything different than what you're doing today, but we are going to start looking at turnout times. We wanna be the first one seen to either put the fire out or, or help with an EMS call. Um, anything to that effect. Turnout times are important, um, but if we don't make it to the call, then we're, we're no good to the person that called us. Sometimes we, we take steps that we normally wouldn't, or expectations are put on us that normally aren't, and it pushes us to do certain things. Everybody's really heightened awareness about getting out the door quick and making sure that we're getting you know good response times, especially with them with everyone being tracked and everything. Did that play some kind of factor? And so the result of that one memo, that one step towards measuring our performance was that in reality, it created an artificial pressure on the women and men in the department to start getting out the door faster. We failed to identify that uh, we were tracking the times, but there were no punitive damages, so to speak, to come from them. At the time of the incident, um, when the alarm bell went off, uh, Josh, Firefighter Holloway, was in the uh, bathroom, or the restroom, uh, and which at that point was one of the farthest away points in the building it could be from the uh, apparatus bay. Uh, so knowing that, that added a little bit more stress to him because uh, he had to quickly go from you know, far away to the apparatus bay, uh, get uh, ready to respond. Just because we are tracking and monitoring turnout times does not mean that we take we cut corners or um, miss out on these safety points, that we still need to perform our job safely and we need to use all of our PPE and all of our safety technology and still get out the door quick. We have all, myself included, all of us have at one time or another done something that we knew was unsafe, but for which there were no consequences. And because there were no consequences, we begin to believe that whatever it is that we're doing is in fact safe, when in reality, it's not. And that's exactly where we found ourselves on this day. After this event, the department started to recruit individuals for the safety review committee and start getting that team together. And then we started going through some of the teaching moments of what we need to look at for this incident, what kind of safety review boards in general do, what kind of uh, factors are they looking at? Are they looking at mitigating causal factors and just stepwise that bigger industry is looking at um, so that we can apply that and actually look at this with educated and informed eyes before we even actually sat down and had our first meeting. In addition, we wanted to make sure that we had a representative from the officer ranks, and then we also wanted to make sure that we had a representative from the firefighter ranks as well. A cross-divisional, cross-discipline, cross-responsibility team uh, that were all focused on one thing. And my charge to them was the report needed to look at the facts and draw some recommendations about how we could avoid this from happening again. Someone fell out of an apparatus. How did this happen? Obviously, right off the get-go, you can be like, well, if they were wearing their seatbelt, then this wouldn't have happened. But we dug into it from a deeper aspect of we started looking first at, was it their equipment malfunction? Was the door latch not working? So we went and had the, the city shop look, try to recreate any kind of issue with the door not latching. We immediately placed the apparatus out of service uh, without knowing what the extent of the damage to the door might be. I thought, well, if the door's broken, if the door failed, if there was something that was wrong, uh, we needed to make sure that the crew did not continue to use the, en use the apparatus. Uh, and then came the reality of knowing just how close we came uh, to losing a firefighter in the line of duty and what we needed to do about 
first, preventing it from ever happening again, and second, uh, making sure that we shared our story. Master Forever Snyder came over and he was like, he's like, you realize what happened today, right? And I was like, yeah, like it truly sank in, like, man, like I probably could have just died. You know, a really good chance of it. It hit you like a brick wall. Once I said, why wouldn't you wear your seatbelt? I said, are you injured? Are you hurt? He said, no, I'm okay. But I think his pride was hurt. You know, he, he had, you know, he's got such pride in what he does. And he don't want to let people down. He had a great truck company that day, a great truck officer and a driver that we were very fortunate when they see the alarm go off and the door being, you know, open or apartment door open. When they look out, they quickly recognize there is an issue going on and they react it in a professional way. Me knowing city policy, me knowing county policy, because in the city of Harrisburg and Rockham County, we do a lot of the same policies. We work together every single day. And I thought, you know, there's policies in place to prevent this from occurring. The other thing I thought, why was you in such a hurry? What type of car was you going to? You know, what, what was the thing or what was the reason you did not buck on that seatbelt that day? The findings of the report were absolutely outstanding. Uh, and I can't thank the committee enough for the work that they did. Uh, they did a thorough job. They interviewed everybody. And the work group really sought to try to understand the whole story. And the fact of the matter is that part of the responsibility for this incident rests squarely on my shoulders. We realized that administration put some undue pressures maybe uh, out there uh, on the staff that we didn't intend. Uh, and it was basically because we, we didn't communicate effectively uh, to let them know that we were, what, what our expectations were of you know, the turnout times. We've all learned back, we've looked at studies, uh, you know, how seatbelts save lives. We've looked at the, the rollover accidents and things like that uh, throughout the United States. And, you know, if you look back at the Sandy Lee story in 1982, when she fell out of a, a truck and got caught up underneath the tandems on the rear end and, and the injuries that she occurred. Uh, when I was training officer, I played that in all of my Firefighter One programs. Um, you know, it is a little outdated now, but that was, that was a story. If you listen to her story, it makes you think, I need to wear a seatbelt. We want to be safe. We want to make sure everybody's in, in, in the rig, and they're actually ready to go. They're fully dressed. You know, either get fully dressed before you get on the rig, or get fully dressed when you get there. But we want to be ready and you know, seated and belted going down the road. Two years later, we are a completely different department than we were. There is an ongoing focus on ensuring that personnel are wearing their seat belts. There's an ongoing focus on making sure that personnel are wearing their personal protective equipment and wearing it properly. There is an ongoing commitment to focusing on turning out in a timely manner because the folks who are providing service understand how important that is in the continuum of what we do. But one of the things that we talk about every day is we're not perfect and we're never going to be perfect. And a commitment to safety has to be more than words on a page. It has to be coupled with action and it has to be coupled with accountability every day. And we still have that job ahead of us. Every day, for as long as we wear this uniform, we will have to ensure that we are holding each other accountable to doing the most important thing that we possibly can do, which is go home at the end of the alarm. Every single day I know these people train, they go over policies, they go over procedures, so I feel very confident at the City of Harrisburg Fire Department did everything they could to prevent this from occurring. Um, sometimes we just have an error in the day, we have a mishap. Uh, you know, your, your mind is thinking, I got to get there. You're thinking about, you know, when you get hit for that structure fire. A lot of things going through your mind. Um, and if you're delayed getting on that truck, sometimes you don't have all your turnout gear on. It's imperative to take that 30 seconds to get your turnout gear on, buckle up, and arrive safely on that scene. I, I would feel awful if this happened somewhere else. You know, I guess with doing this, awareness of what our situation could help somebody down the road. I and mean, if it just saves one person from it happening, that's worth it. Even if I'm taking the engine on Maryland Avenue for not even a tenth of a mile, I just, I just go ahead and I clip it just because you just, you never know. Yeah. You can't do anything unless you get there safe. You know, like whether it takes an additional 10 seconds, every little thing that you do, 
you know, can make or break you even getting to the call or making the call right. I would say that always make sure you're ready to go out the door, seat belt and everything. Don't take it for granted. When firefighters are injured responding to a call, nothing gets better. Our first job is to make sure that after we turn out for the call, that we actually arrive and then perform to the very best of our ability. We should never forget the responsibility that we have to get to a call safely. Our expectations are we want quick turnout times, but we never wanted to sacrifice safety. Safety still should be our first and foremost uh, goal. Um, we can't do no good unless we get there. What drives firefighters to action is compliance and a demand for accountability. Company officers need to hold their people accountable. Apparatus operators should never move a vehicle without making sure that the personnel in the vehicle are seated and belted. It's literally that simple. We always say, oh, that ain't gonna happen to me. That's not gonna happen here. Um, well, it happened in small town Harrisonburg, so it, it can happen anywhere. It's a violent video. It's hard to see that video. Uh, it's hard to see Josh being thrown out onto the roadway and understand just how close he came to being killed. Because when we say that we're gonna do everything we can to bring our firefighters home alive and then we don't do it, that's a catastrophic failure on our part.